Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. And today it's an honor to welcome Billy Misak. He's an amazing activist, advocate, and even analyst now. And he'll be sharing with us some of the exciting things going on around the globe. What we'll be doing today is we'll be looking at the UN General Assembly high level the general debate, the UN Food Summit, and what's coming up with Glasgow COP26. It'll be a blue Pacific perspective to save our planet. Willie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cooper. I know the UN high level general debate mm. is a very important time. Can you highlight mm -hmm. some of the points that uh, the head of state of Vanuatu raised and why those are significant mm -hmm. mm -hmm. around the planet? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you uh, very, uh, very much, uh, Mr. Kuba, and thank you all for, for having me here. Um, um, I think uh, the um, UN General Assembly is a very critical uh, assembly, especially for this year, regarding all the different issues that we have. Um, for example, uh, our uh, head of uh, state, uh, our prime minister, uh, outlined some of the very uh, important uh, issues like uh, climate change that are impacting uh, the people in Vanuatu and across the Pacific region. And as you know, uh, uh, Vanuatu is also champion in this uh, in the human right and looking for um, self-determination and supporting the, the countries like uh, New Caledonia, uh, French Polynesia, and also West Papua to, to, uh, to move at, uh, into the area of becoming also independent as a uh, Melanesian countries and the people of the Pacific. So those are the very um, uh, important points that has been highlighted by the uh, Prime Ministers of uh, Vanuatu uh, on looking back uh, on that so that the, that the countries in the Pacific apply their, their human rights and having self-determination for their own country and independence and stand uh, on, on, their, on their own for their culture and for their people and for their life in, in the Pacific. And this is very important to consider. It is always great to see Vanuatu as a champion, as you pointed out, on self-determination consistently, really as part of Melanesian Spearhead Group, but being the voice and the conscience of the blue continent in that way. And I know people always look forward to hearing the speech of Vanuatu for its consistent call for self-determination for all. And this time, though, they also raised the important point about maybe the International Court of Justice and climate change. Could you share how that motion was brought forward and how you've played a positive role in bringing that call to the global general assembly absolutely absolutely uh, Cooper. Uh, when we're looking back and, and look back all the impacts of, of, of climate change itself in uh, in the pacific region let, let me let me take it at, at, as a, a context and looking at different abilities displacement that is happening around the pacific region and it becomes clear that uh, although uh, the pacific islands are contributing very, very less into the um, uh, global emissions, but are at the front lines of uh, its impact. <clears throat> so we, we, we know that uh, that um, one of the uh, 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 very using, useful talk from the Pacific youth about we are not drowning, but we are fighting, uh, we are looking at uh, justice among uh, all the country, those who are at the front line and emitted very less, but uh, at the front end of the, those impact, uh, trying to, to, to looking at all the different um, ways to make sure that globally we, we, we try to stabilize um, the, uh, the global temperature below 1.5 Celsius. And going to the International Court of Justice is very, uh, very sort of critical for all the countries, not only more than one. That is uh, for, for, the, uh, for the global community as a whole. And Vanuatu, as you mentioned, uh, and we, we just see recently on the news that coming out of Vanuatu is sleeping on the youth in the Pacific are in the front line as well and supporting the Vanuatu government, taking this to the UN uh, uh, Assembly as well to make sure that we have that advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice for, for uh, climate change. And uh, this is a uh, very critical because when we're looking at, uh, let's say, Vanuatu, uh, just uh, in, in the period of five years, we have two uh, category five uh, cyclone that we, which is beyond expectation. And what was in, in, in the in the first category of five uh, cyclone pump uh, and 64.1% of its GDP. And now it's continued to increase recently with the DC arrow 
65% of its GDP. So we can see that, and we can see that even the human fundamental right are also affected by the impact of climate change. And the question will be, is it justice for everyone? And clearly we can see that some, some countries that are very um, less contributing on emissions, but uh, have their right, uh, their fundamental right is taken away because of the impact of climate change. So it brings us to the question of justice. Excellent. And we know that was also spoken about at the Pacific Island Forum. Did you see how that went maybe this year and some of the highlights and why the Pacific Island Forum is an important space for the blue continent to come together and speak with what's possible for the planet? Exactly. Um, I think the, the Pacific Island Forum is very uh, critical for all the Pacific Island where governments come together and discuss the fundamental issues that they are, they are facing in the Pacific, and also trying to looking at possible ways and um, even possible solutions to address it as a Pacific Islanders, and also beyond looking at creating different allies. And this is where uh, the Pacific Island leaders can and join their voices together looking at the development of the betterment of the Pacific as whole as small nations. And we are also very vulnerable on the impact of different uh, climate change and also other different diseases. And um, I think that space of uh, Pacific Island Forum provide this opportunity to even uh, uh, the country beyond Pacific to start thinking on the same perspective, uh, especially uh, small um, developing states across the globe like Arabian Island, have sort of sharing the same perspective and context as well as a small island nations. And the Pacific Island Forum is very critical. And this year was one of the um, very useful uh, Pacific Island Forum where, people, uh, where the Pacific Islands really talk about, and one of the things that is really stand out is also climate change, where they're really uh, looking at what will be the possible way when they are very much more impacted beyond their own expectations as a, as a country uh, to, to uh, respond on that in the Pacific. And that area is very critical for all the Pacific Island leaders. It's great to get your insight from the Pacific Island Forum meeting that recently happened, and also the UN General Assembly high-level general debate, absolutely important. There was also UN Food Summit, and we know you have a new hat now at Food and Agriculture Organization, the food Summit was held to look at the future of food. And there are also important initiatives that they're looking at. Could you maybe share some of the highlights of the UN Food System Summit and why that's important for everyone around the world to understand? Uh, yeah, I think this, is, uh, this year's uh, Food Summit is very uh, also important. Why, why that is because um, as um, we see the COVID-19 pandemic, comes to bring us back to realize that there is some um, food system that we have to change nationally or locally that can contribute on the global food stability and also sustaining um, the food within uh, the countries in terms of the disasters as well. So this uh, food summit was also providing an opportunity to the country to start building the framework around food and see how they address food at a sustainable way where uh, uh, they will continue to produce uh, the food and also have a stable food. So when we're looking at that and thinking about diet as well, we're looking at a different, um, a different way of uh, 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 addressing the different uh, uh, food that we have. In the Pacific, when we're looking at it in the Pacific and talking about uh, the, uh, the diet in the Pacific, we can see that diabetes is one of the very big uh, issues in, in the Pacific Island. And that forum provides this opportunity to look back on how we um, produce food internally, like really local and organic food that can help not only uh, reducing um, the diseases, but also contributing on um, the sustainable um, development goal on reducing hunger across the, the globe. And the pandemic gave us this opportunity to stand back and looking at how our food chain is driven from the garden to the plates of the people and how organically and healthy is this. Mm -hmm. And that summit is very critical because it comes to the time where we have a, a COVID-19 pandemic that all the borders are closes. We have reduced the trades between different countries uh, on, on food, 
and gives us a, a, that opportunity to looking back on our indigenous way. And this is one of the very, really, very really important things is that looking back on our indigenous way of sustaining and stabilizing food for health uh, uh, communities and countries. That's a really good point. We know it's crucial to change the way that we do produce and consume food. And we have to shift a message, as you pointed out, that are resilient to shocks, more environmental friendly, and enhance our individual health and well being. It was great that you also brought up the sustainable development goals, because that's also a positive framework. We can look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the right to food, mm -hmm. but we can also then see the SDGs as a framework that also assists us. And you did point out and sort of echoed what the president of the General Assembly said. He said, every nook of this planet has its own microclimate, its own unique growing conditions. And so that's one of the things that we can look at is the diverse food of the planet and the seeds they come from. That's a priceless piece of our humanity and how we in the Pacific can share those. We can look at niu or breadfruit, at coconut, at so many aspects and see, of course, how that's all provided. Mm. That's really true. And, uh, and we, we also come to realize that um, when we're looking at, um, uh, let's say in Vanuatu, uh, before the pandemic and during the pandemic, now we see that there is, um, it become more clear that the Vanuatu uh, government itself realized that it needs a framework of uh, of food to address food in Vanuatu, as we can uh, when we're looking at the uh, importation even for food in Vanuatu is starting to, uh, it's it's declining uh, when uh, during the, the pandemic, and as I mentioned, this provides big opportunity to the governments in the Pacific Island themselves also to be looking back on how the food is uh, produced internally and also trying to thinking on beyond that during uh, because uh, uh, as we, we see that we have that uh, impact of climate change, how we gonna sustain that beyond those impact as well to make sure that we secure food for the communities and the people and the region as well. That's a really good point. And we also saw the UN special procedures of the Human Rights Council. Some of the rapporteurs on the right to food, on human rights and the environment and extreme poverty and human rights came together and they were echoing your point that the summit might present human rights to governments as an optional policy instead of a set of legal obligations. Maybe you can share some of the highlights that show how we do have the solutions today and how maybe the Pacific might also lead with food systems and potential ways going forward to make sure that we look at how it's grown, but then also how it comes to our plate, as you said, sort of from farm to fork. Yeah, sure. Um, I think when we when we're looking at the food as well, uh, we were looking at one of the of the it aspect is, is is the leadership or the governance as, as well. Um, when we talk about food, um, as as you mentioned, this is will always coming up and end uh, in in our plates. And looking at that, there is a leadership and there is a governance. So this is something that even the Vanuatu government looking at what is the leadership and the governance when we're talking about the food from one um, going out uh, in a food chain that we, we are looking at. So it will, it will, it will seem like the Vanuatu government is starting now, after the summit, looking back on develop, on reviewing the policies of the food in Vanuatu, which is really, really good, really, really good. And it, it's kind of a, a very good example for other Pacific Island region as well, to looking back on those uh, governance and, 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 and leadership or on that where communities, indigenous people are taking leadership and having a stable and, and, and structured governance that help people can, through that governance, having a mechanism that can develop all different ways that people can, can have access, uh, access to food. So this is one thing about, about that, that, looking at the leadership and the governance and, and also improving diets and, and food environment. When, 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 when we're looking at that, this is the other things that when we are shaping that into a policy, it, it will help us uh, take, uh, it will help um, the, uh, the, the initiatives that all the current initiatives that the governments and the people are taking in terms of, of, of diet and food environment uh, to be more sustainable and increase uh, local production capacities and improve even um, its food environment. We ensure that uh, people 
have uh, access to more healthy and nutrition diets. And uh, the other point is that um, when we're looking at that, uh, we're thinking about the resilience of food system and livelihood. So, for example, Vanuatu will promote uh, and implement initiatives uh, where, such as um, climate smart techniques uh, and uh, proven traditional practices for food uh, production, uh, processing, and uh, distribution, which is uh, which is will strengthen the resilience and enable uh, productive um, work and descends livelihood along the food system of value chain. So uh, some, those, are those three uh, three points that uh, I'm sharing, which is um, leadership and governance and improved diets and, and food environment and resilient food system are sort of something to be developed in, in a policy that will address um, the way people uh, have access to food and in a sustainable way as well and a stable food uh, as well. It brought a smile to my face because I remember the amazing food market there in Vanuatu where the people bring it from all over and then it's it's just there in front of you. You can see the abundance, which is not something that people always think about, but it's so amazing to see everything that is grown with that traditional knowledge and also the indigenous way of caring for nature. And I think what you're bringing up talks about a community, not a corporate approach, and you can see, though, as you were there and when I visited in Vanuatu, so much food being produced for the people and how delicious it is. So that's mm -hmm. then changing the conditions. And that's one of the aspects. I also like how you shared, besides the sustainable development goals, also looking at the importance of seeing the crises all together, that they're all linked. And Secretary General Guterres said that, unfortunately, the world seems to be waging a war against nature and reaping that bitter harvest with the ruined crops, the dwindling incomes, and failing food systems, and also how food systems generate a third of all the greenhouse gas emissions. And so I think if we do look at the General Assembly, if we look at the Food Summit, and also look forward on that road to Glasgow, we can see how we can have a common approach from a community perspective that's united with a globalization movement of global civil society, and how we have the solutions to be able to strive towards 1.5 as we get to go and good to go to Glasgow. I know that's coming up in the next month. Can you share a little bit about how you're preparing? What is at stake in Glasgow and what people can do? I think first thing I want to, to, to share towards Glasgow is um, countries must re review uh, the indices before Glasgow, as uh, the, general, uh, the Secretary General just recently mentioned. Uh, will be right, the nationally exactly. determined contributions are exactly. very, very important. Exactly. There is a submission, but now he called for another submission for the countries, and you know, this is uh, a very critical one. Um, when, we, when you're looking at uh, accessing those indices, there is, you can see actions and plans uh, around it, but there is uh, some sort of uh, actions that is, is still needed to make sure that uh, those indices are more robust. Um, I think the question is why the, the Secretary, uh, Secretary General call again for uh, resubmission for other indices. So this is a, a question that will, will come back. My, when you're looking at those uh, indices that are already submitted, it's clear that there is some lack of uh, other um, ambitious action on that. And this is critical because when you're looking at the IPCC report and in the Pacific itself, it's re very frightening. And young people in the Pacific, like me, already start to worry about what will be the future if we go beyond the pinch of two uh, degrees Celsius. It's a really As good this, point. It is, it is really clear that the science says there is no way back. So I am totally agree with the uh, Secretary General that the country must review, again, the indices to submit towards Glasgow. Otherwise, Glasgow will be, says, an uh, arena of talking with no concrete action to move things forward. So this is re uh, really important. And also, we're thinking very, on the other way that today, many different talking points that has been raised across uh, the last past COPs are yet to be implemented. Whereas we keep piling up upon each other with no actions. And this is really critical. 
that we have to looking at doing actions rather than start putting more papers upon papers and sitting on the table with no actions. And we are going to a very critical point at this stage. And Glasgow is very, very critical. Um, call. Yes, you brought up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and they created their sixth report in August. And it did point out what you were saying and what everyone in the Pacific is seeing. We don't need to, to be a scientist, or we have many traditional mechanisms to be able to monitor it, but we are reaching a point where people of the Pacific lives will be at stake. It's an existential threat. So you did point out, he's sort of like a, a school teacher. He received the reports and said, some good homework, but not enough. How about take it home again and do another draft? I believe he said it was around 2.7. But why is 1.5 so important? And why should those countries go back to their Congresses and their parliaments and come up with a better draft of their nationally determined contribution? It is, it is very, very important that, uh, for, for firstly, is that if we go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius, we will have constant um, impact. And as I mentioned to one of, uh, some of our, our, our colleagues, when we are talking about adaptation in the Pacific, I, to, uh, uh, I told them that adaptation in the Pacific, it says now in a sort of uh, um, uh, a way of discussion, but in reality, adaptation in the Pacific is a total loss, if you can see, and damages that we can have. Many development of um, adaptation projects, for example, um, building seawall, we cannot stop it. The sea level will continue to raise. And when we're looking at uh, 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 and that, we can see that 1.5 degrees Celsius, when we, go, we surpass that point, the, uh, the sea level rise will be raised. And in the Pacific alone, it's been, it been projected that in 2100, the sea level rise in the Pacific alone will be reached one meter. And this is, I would say, most of the Pacific development are coastal cities. You can see in Port Vila, um, uh, the, uh, the Port Vila city is on the coast. Imagine in 1.5 degree, uh, in 1.5 uh, uh, level, water level rise, the inundation will wash out the city in one second. So we are losing it. We can lose everything that we are building for ages. It says only one second. So uh, th this is why when we're talking about 1.5 degrees Celsius, we, we have to really think about that this is uh, beyond the normal way of living. When we're looking back 20 decades back, it is beyond that. And it, it will be a constant disaster, I would put it in, the, in that way, a constant disaster for small island nations like the islands in the Pacific. It's true, I would be sad. We wouldn't be able to go to number one cafe there be no more movie nights on Wednesday. Everything that has been created there in that space would go under. And there's many islands as well in Vanuatu. Could you maybe share how climate change is impacting some of the other islands? Port Villa, of course, I remember yes, that experience, but I know you do a lot of good work around the communities. Yes, of course. Uh, um, uh, two weeks ago, we were in one of the island called Emau and in a very beautiful uh, uh, community on the coast um, uh, called Maro Village. And it's a very beautiful village. The saddest thing about it is when we went there to, to looking at how we can uh, we, we help the communities to understand that they are facing a sea level rise and there will be something that is, uh, they, they, they have to do. And the only thing they have to do is to move and lose everything there. And those things have been there for hundreds of years. I would say their life depend on that small island where they stay. The schools are now looking for new places. And recently I went to Anaichon, one of the, um, where the mystery island is in the southern part of Anuatu. A whole school, primary to college, are moving out from where they are because they are afraid that maybe at nighttime or maybe during the cyclone, they will be washed away easily. So those islands are facing 
those in Pagani as well, as you, as you say, yeah, I'm totally agree with you. You don't have, you, you don't need science in the Pacific to understand the impact of climate change. It's there, you can see it. And more, uh, one of the things that really um, uh, touches me is the shifting of the whole cultural knowledge. It's really sad to see that because when I was in one of the uh, uh, islands in Tana, where the volcano is, we went there, they, they usually have the ritual of yam, but that ritual period was changed from May to June. And the custom knowledge has been really uh, shocked and confusing because they, know, they don't know when will be the next harvest so that they will um, uh, uh, perform the ritual for the yam. The yam is a very essential food for uh, uh, the people in, in Vanuatu and the secret and spiritual uh, uh, food that contain all spiritual and cultural knowledge. So those shifting are losses. And I would say this is a non-economic loss. And none of our, when you come to that knowledge, and you can see that this knowledge is been um, moving or shifting, biting back to climate change, there is no money that can compare that. Thank you. I, I know the point you're raising brings up how the social, the spiritual are so essential. And it's also, though, the political structure. You were talking about the yams to bring it back to the food again. But then also, I remember the democracy tree, where there's the mode of dialogue and deliberation and discussion and decisions are made, but then also the dancing that happens afterwards. So we'll not only lose the essential aspects of food and the culture, but even the decision-making processes that are so rich in that historical parts of that Vanuatu could really teach the world in many ways. How's our democracy chief doing? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think um, uh, those, 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 those spirituality, um, it's sadly impacted by the um, uh, impact of, um, of uh, climate change and uh, also, as we mentioned in that in that food uh, summit that uh, um, uh, that FAO just uh, just have it, it's all also sh uh, show that even the food is impacted in in in, in the market as well. Uh, the uh, the cultivation part and and also the shifting and this shifting will, will also, when when it when it had this impact on cultural um, knowledge and cultural way of living that really uh, hit the whole governance as well as you mentioned, maybe moving, moving this around the, 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 the way of democracy uh, as well. So those, those shifting on, on the governance impacted, uh, it's kind of like a food chain that one thing's impact and touches everything. And, uh, and the, the, most is, uh, the most important thing when we're talking about food is that when the food falls out, falls out to the system, everyone uh, suffering. So this is something that we are learning, in, but not only suffering because of the food, but also suffering that those going into uh, the people that have cultural knowledge are trying to, to struggle to find and reconnect it, uh, themselves with the spiritual nature and the spirituality of the uh, environment around them. Perfect. And I, I look forward to, I know where we see each other at the Conference of Parties, uh, look forward that we'll both be good to go to Glasgow. And I know the issue there, of course, will be loss and damage. Maybe you can close with that. But then even going further, we can look at that world court opinion on intergenerational responsibilities of governments regarding the impact of climate change, which you've shared with us today. Sure, absolutely, uh, uh, Kuba. Let me link those two things together. Um, loss and damage is one of the very uh, big uh, and challenging issues when it comes to uh, COP negotiation, where uh, a country trying to looking at how the, the, the compensation uh, uh, on that. And how is this linked with the International Court of Justice is that when we're looking at Article um, 8 and Paragraph 51 of the Paris Agreement, where prevents, uh, uh, I would say, prevents people or countries as a big polluter to take their responsibilities to looking for compensation and liability to the countries that are less um, contributing to the impact of climate change, but um, um, uh, uh, in the, at, at the front line of, of this impact. So when we look at this too, loss and damage, 
and uh, the International Court of Justice, we can see that we can draw the line between the justice and the losses that we, we see uh, on, on, on the uh, as an impact of uh, uh, climate change. So when we're talking about that, um, I think one of the critical issues uh, that we we'll really talk about is loss and damage, uh, where we're trying to look at how um, uh, how we can uh, provide more financial support for the countries that uh, are lost a lot. And we and I, I must say, Cooper, that each year the uh, the loss and damage is um, financially increasing, and even adaptation when we do nothing. So it's increasing up to trillions of uh, billions of dollars. So this is, will be beyond our expectation. So we need to address as soon as we want and as soon as possible with this COP, which is a critical COP for everyone. Lily, thank you so much for taking time and speaking with us and dedicating your life to protecting our planet. Thank you as well for the Blue Pacific perspective. And we'll see you in Glasgow. Thank you very much, uh, Thank you for having me. Aloha. Aloha.